Hey guys, today we're going to be talking about a fallacy called affirming the consequent. Now in several of my videos, people argue that the moral argument commits this fallacy. So let's take a look at what affirming the consequent means and see if the moral argument commits it or not. Arguments that take the form of if-then statements are going to be the ones that are susceptible to this type of fallacy. So let's take a look at an example to see what this fallacy is and how we can avoid it. Let's use basketball as an analogy. If you make a free throw, then a hoop must exist. Another way of saying that is, if no hoop exists, then you can't make a free throw. Just imagine that, you'd be like Shaq, completely unable to hit a free throw. In fact, if there's no hoop, you couldn't even hit rim. You'd airball it all the time. That would probably be the worst game of basketball ever. The point is that it's absolutely necessary to have a hoop in order to make a free throw. That's why they call having a hoop the necessary condition. And the necessary condition is also called the consequent. As the word consequent suggests, this usually comes at the end of the sentence after the word then. Now making a free throw is not the only way to prove a hoop exists. So making a free throw is not necessary to prove a hoop exists, but it is a sufficient way to do so. That's why they call making a free throw the sufficient condition. And the sufficient condition is also called the antecedent. As the word antecedent suggests, this usually comes at the beginning of the sentence after the word if. Now there is an occasional exception to this rule though. As we said earlier, these two statements are exactly the same. If you make a free throw, then a hoop exists, is equivalent to saying, if no hoops exist, then you can't make a free throw. Now the tricky part is, when we added the words no or not to both parts of the argument, that made the necessary or consequent condition come first, and the sufficient or antecedent come at the end. So that's one thing you need to be aware of. So now let's look at affirming the antecedent. If you make a free throw, then a hoop exists. Now if we affirm the antecedent, then that means our second premise is, you made a free throw. So that would make our conclusion, a hoop exists. Now that's a valid argument because it's impossible for the first two statements, also called premises, to be true and the conclusion to be false. Now let's take a look at affirming the consequent. The first premise is going to be the same. If we make a free throw, then a hoop exists. But if we affirm the consequent, the second premise is going to be, a hoop exists. Now if both premises are true, and whatever the conclusion is could be false, then this argument is fallacious. Now the conclusion would be, therefore, you made a free throw. So let's watch this white boy play some basketball and see if the conclusion must be true or not. So now that we know what affirming the consequent is, let's see if the moral argument commits this fallacy. The moral argument says, if God does not exist, then objective morality does not exist. Objective morality exists, therefore God exists. So let's take a closer look at that first part. If God does not exist, then objective morality does not exist. Now as we showed with the basketball analogy, that's equivalent to saying, if objective morality exists, then God exists. Either way you say it, all that it means is that God is the necessary condition for objective morality, and that objective morality is a sufficient way to prove that he exists. Now, as you know, the necessary condition is called the consequent, and the sufficient condition is called the antecedent. Since the second premise says objective morality exists, clearly that affirms the antecedent, and there's nothing fallacious about doing that. This argument does not affirm the consequent and is in valid form. As always, test everything, hold on to the good.